It is very important to understand that there are two levels of forgiveness. Level one is the foundation. It is an unconditional, attitudinal heart forgiveness. And it is between you and God. We release the offender from our judgment and entrust them to God. Level two naturally flows from level one. And it is a conditional, granted, relational forgiveness between you and the other person or persons. Perhaps you've gone through the three steps of pursuing relational peace. You have sought to please God. You have repented of your heart sins, that is, sinful beliefs and sinful motives. You have repented of your behavior sins, that is, sinful words and sinful actions. And now you have loved that person like Christ has loved you. And you have approached them, asked for their forgiveness. And now reconciliation is possible. So how do you respond if the person for forgives you, if the person repents? Number one, we should promise not to dwell on his or her sin that was against us. You can't say that you're going to forgive and forget because you can make no promise that that thought won't come back to your mind. And it likely will at times. But you can promise not to dwell upon that thought. You can't stop a bird from landing on your head. But you can stop that bird from building a nest. Knock that bird off your head. Knock that thought off your head. And do not allow it to dwell there. Also, we should promise to this person that we're not going to gossip about his or her sin. That is, we're not going to tell other people. We're not going to bring other people into our previous conflict, into the situation that has been forgiven, into the situation that has been reconciled. Also, we promise not to bring up his or her sin against that person again. That is, we have forgiven them. Now, if a new sin occurs, this is a new situation. But we're not to bring that forgiven sin up again and hold it against them. And our promise to forgive does not demand that the other person change. And this can be a very difficult element of forgiveness. But you cannot know the full reality of a person's repentance. You can only really take their word for it. And if they have offered repentance and you can reconcile that relationship, you need to take them at their word and not demand that they change. If you demand that they change, you say, I can forgive them for so-and-so, for this or that, but I just need to know that it will never happen again. They can't make that promise. And truthfully, if it does happen again, this is just a new situation to reconcile. This is a new conflict. And we're always going to be facing new conflicts, and perhaps even with the same person. So we need to not put a demand upon that person to change, but we come to them honestly and ask their forgiveness for what we've done against them. And perhaps they have repented and this relationship has been restored. But remember, our promise to forgive that person is based on level one forgiveness. That is giving them to God. You have released the offender from your judgment and entrusted them to God. And that's why reconciliation can happen. So what are the next steps in this reconciled relationship? Well, you should restore this relationship to a wise and appropriate level. And I want to make that distinction that it needs to be wise and appropriate. Some relationships, you're never going to be able to have them back in the same way. Some sins, you just really never recover from in those relationships. The person may forgive you, and you may forgive them. But some relationships are not wise or appropriate to continue. If you're in an abusive relationship, it would likely not be wise to continue in that relationship. If you are in a relationship that is illegal, let's say that the, the state has said you can't see your children. Well, if the state says that, you need to obey that law. So even though forgiveness can happen in transactions, we still need to be wise about that restored relationship. It may not be the same. Also, a reconciled, reconciled relationship, we should make sure again that we don't bring up that sin again. And if we do, 
if we fail and we bring up their sin and hang it over their head again, we need to repent again. We need to seek forgiveness. We need to start that level one and please God and repent of any sins. There's a wise approach to a restored relationship. A wise approach to a restored relationship, one is to know that person. Understand their tendencies, their personality, their attitudes. Helps you to have empathy and being able to forgive and have that restored relationship with that person. And understanding them, you can really minister to that person wisely. People are different. I don't have to tell you that. You know that. People are different. You know, we need to love all people. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. He describes three different personalities or people there. But for all of them, we are to minister to them wisely. A wise approach to restore relationship also practices godly listen, listening and godly speaking as well. In Proverbs 18 and 13, we read, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. Likewise, in James 1 and 19, we read, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. If only we were always swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath, we would probably solve many of the conflicts that we deal with. So we need to practice godly listening and godly speaking in this restored relationship. Another wise approach is to work together with that individual to solve problems. This is especially true if that person is a Christian as well. Work together to solve problems because difference of opinion will remain because people are different again and we should be willing to compromise on decisions in many ways the only thing we never compromise on is the truth of god's word beyond that our wants we should be willing to compromise in philippians 2 2 through 4 paul encourages us and says fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We should be willing to look out for the interest of others. We should be willing to put aside our wants and be willing to compromise. One way to approach this uh, working to solve problems with this individual is the issues, positions, interest model. And this is just a simple chart, really. And you're saying, this is what the issue is. This is my position. This is the other person's position. And now let's dig in. What are the interests? Why is it that we have this position? And as we discuss this, this problem-solving tool really helps us to reach a mutual understanding. And truthfully, how many conflicts come from misunderstanding? But as we sit and really work with this person, it brings clarity to the problem, and it helps us to seek really a others-centered attitude, not just thinking about ourselves, but trying to understand where that person is coming from. A humble, forgiving person should be willing to compromise their wants. And Christians should always be seeking to please God. And here's the truth. If two Christians are both seeking to please God in their relationships, they will always resolve their conflicts. Always. If two Christians are both seeking to please God, they will always resolve their conflicts. But here's the reality we see. Church splits. Infighting. Divorce. It shows how far we have to go in pleasing God. But let us remember, God is never pleased with sin. We need to deal with it. Now, conflict with a Christian is one thing, but a conflict with a non-believer really shouldn't surprise us because it's really going to be more difficult to reconcile with that individual because you have very different worldviews 
And a non-believer is not seeking to please God. They're not. And by nature, they are selfish. Now here's the reality, is this is where we come from. Our selfish nature is what a Christian is killing daily. When Jesus tells us to take up the, that cross, our cross, to follow him, we are killing that selfish nature. We are submitting to Christ and his lordship. A Christian should not be a barrier to reconciliation, but it may be more difficult to reconcile with a non-believer. Just remember that you're responsible for your relationship to God. You cannot control the other person's actions or reactions, but you can always love God and you can always love that other person. Remember, level two forgiveness is conditional. So you've forgiven that other person. You are no longer a barrier to reconciliation and you attempt to reconcile. But what happens when that other person refuses to reconcile? What if the other person won't forgive you? One, it may be wise to seek counsel. And that counsel could be from your pastor or a biblical counselor or a close Christian friend. So seek counsel and allow more time. Again, if the sin is especially serious, it may take more time for reconciliation to take place. Pray for that individual. Pray for them. And consider a follow-up with them as well. Don't give up. And perhaps you even come to them and ask reasons why they're not willing to reconcile with you or not willing to forgive you. Perhaps as you go through the seven A's of confession that we discussed in the previous video, maybe you need to repeat those seven A's of confession in different words, making sure that you're communicating plainly to that person. And not only should you seek counsel, perhaps you should encourage that person to seek counsel as well that is not willing to reconcile with you. And you may have to even confront them about the sin of unforgiveness. That is rebuke them. And that's probably one of the most difficult parts of reconciliation is when you have to rebuke somebody. But all in all, if that person won't forgive you, you need to continue to rejoice if you have sought to please the Lord. Again, I say that. Rejoice if you have sought to please the Lord because you've given them to God. And God's going to deal with the situation. God's going to deal with that individual as well. You need to seek to please God. Forgive that person from the heart. Give them to God. And then the outcome is in God's hands. Some relationships cannot be repaired for a variety of reasons. We cannot control another person's actions. But again, you're responsible for yourself. You're called to love God and love other people. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here if the person refuses to reconcile? Should we rebuke them? That is, call out their sin. Should we rebuke them? Sometimes we are to overlook sins. And overlooking a sin does not mean a denial of its occurrence. Overlooking a sin really means that we have chosen to forgive them of that sin and absorb whatever those consequences are for that sin. But sometimes rebuking is necessary. In Proverbs 27, 5 through 6, we read, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Are we being faithful in rebuking someone? Are we trying to deceive them and that everything is okay? Jesus shows true love by rebuking us. In Revelation 3 and 19, Jesus says, as many as I, as I love, I rebuke. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He rebukes us because he loves us. And this is a hard task, rebuking somebody. And it's a hard task because of our own sin struggles in our heart. We have to be careful to guard our heart against sin when we rebuke somebody. Because certainly we can become angry and bitter when someone refuses to reconcile. But sinning against them still is displeasing to God. 
So how should we discern when a re rebuke is needed? Default response for a Christian really is to overlook sins, to love like Christ. If it's a minor offense, absolutely overlook it. If it's a really serious offense, perhaps rebuke is necessary. Now rebuke is certainly appropriate if the other person welcomes it. And you will understand that in the relationships that you have. If it's another Christian individual, they will welcome that rebuke so they can become right with God, that they can please God with their own life. And it's also appropriate to rebuke a person when that relationship is absolutely strained or undermined by that sin continuing. Call them out on that, but also do it in love. It's also appropriate to rebuke somebody if their sin is hurting themselves. Try to help them to see the folly of their choices. It's also appropriate to rebuke if you see someone that is trapped in a pattern of sin or in danger of being trapped in a pattern of sin. And again, that really focuses on the church or the Christian person in general to understand that that sin is not going to, to really bring them any benefit in life. It's also appropriate to rebuke somebody when their sin is hurting other people. If their sin is hurting other people, we need to call that out. And it's appropriate to rebuke when their sin is especially serious. You can look through the Bible and see the various list of sins. Especially serious sins that are just a chaos to family, to friends, uh, to life in general. We need to address that. We need to be wise. We need to seek uh, God prayerfully and to understand when it's appropriate to rebuke somebody. It's also appropriate to rebuke somebody if they're bringing shame to the name of Christ. That is a professed Christian that is living in unrepentant sin. We need to rebuke them for they're attached to the name of Christ. It's also appropriate to rebuke somebody if the church's health is threatened by them. We need to call out their sin. Now, I want to make a point here for recently the Southern Baptist Convention had released a review of many sexual sins and things that were covered up by some churches. The church's health may have been threatened in some manner, but that approach was not appropriate because they weren't rebuking the sinners. So this is not saying to cover up to protect the church. We are addressing sin so that there is reconciliation. We are addressing sin so that people are repenting. And sometimes in this rebuke, it is appropriate to have law enforcement even involved. So we have to be mindful and we have to be prayerful as we seek God's will. So how do we prepare to rebuke? So I said it's a hard task to rebuke a person and we have to be careful to guard our heart against sin. So how do we prepare? Well, number one is please God. That's the same way that you start off in trying to uh, forgive to really bring resolution to a conflict please God so address any personal sin that you have in the conflict make sure your hearts right with God and have a clear goal to why you are rebuking this person a clear goal that is the to reconcile them the goal is not to defeat an enemy if that's your goal you do not need to rebuke also we need to have a clear conscience in this rebuke if you're not rebuking a person out of love, if there's any doubt about that, you do not need to rebuke that person. Prepare your heart before you approach them. And when you rebuke a person, you need to be willing to take next steps, whatever that may be. In a church situation, church discipline, we should bring another believer along if that person refuses to repent when it's just us one-on-one. -on -one. Bring another individual or individuals in to rebuke that person. And if they still don't listen, then you bring it before the church as a whole so the church can lovingly pursue this individual and call them to repentance. Also, we might need biblical counsel before we rebuke someone. Perhaps you don't know how to approach the situation and you need the wisdom of the Lord, your pastor, a biblical counselor, a trusted Christian friend, completely appropriate before you're going forward with this rebuke. And also, 
in the midst of rebuke, let us always remember that we need to fear God rather than people. That is, we do what is right, no matter the consequences. We do what is right to please God and not to please that individual. And sometimes when you bring rebuke, that may be the end of that relationship. You have to count the cost and fear God rather than fear people. Now after you've searched your heart, you've searched the reason, and you're prepared to rebuke this person, how do you rebuke them? One, contact the person privately. For a face-to-face -face is the preferred way, really, to do this. For a private meeting about an important matter. To ask to rebuke them, to call for repentance. And at that meeting, make sure you state your concern humbly. And one way to do that is with I messages. So instead of saying, you did this and you did that, start the conversation with, I value our relationship. May I share a concern with you. See, so you're stating your concern humbly. And as you state your concern, as you discuss this with this individual, ask about the apparent offense. Don't assume or accuse, but try to understand where this person is coming from, of why they're not repenting of this, why they're not reconciling in this relationship. And as we rebuke someone, we need to listen with Christ-like compassion and wisdom. That is always appropriate for every relationship. For that reconciled relationship and this relationship that's trying to have reconciliation. When you're rebuking the person, you need to listen to them with Christ-like compassion and wisdom. And then clearly express your concern. Clearly. Don't beat around the bush about it. Go right to the point of what you're trying to communicate to this individual. And then invite repentance. Invite them to repent. Hopefully they will. But that's not always the case. So what if the person remains hostile and cold even after you have approached them with rebuke? The answer is love. That last step, the reconciliation, love. In Luke 6, 27-28, Jesus says, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Love. So where do you go from here? This relationship perhaps is not restored. Where do you go? Well, number one, you keep your relationship with God central. Pleasing God should be your highest aim in life, not pleasing people. And you should cherish your identity in Christ. That is so important, to cherish our identity in Christ. For God's love outweighs any human rejection. In Psalm 27 and 10, we are comforted with these words. It says, When my father... And my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. The only perfect relationship is with our Lord, who never sins, who always has our best interest in mind, who always loves us. So when our father or our mother forsake us, the Lord will take us up. The Lord will take care of us. But fill in that blank. When my spouse forsakes me, then the Lord will take care of me. When my brother forsakes me, then the Lord will take care of me. When my friend forsakes me, then the Lord will take care of me. When my boss forsakes me, then the Lord will take care of me. When my children forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Keep your relationship with God central. And then review, renew, and redo your peacemaking efforts. That is, do not give up. Don't give up on that individual. Don't give up on your walk with God. Review, review your commitment to please God and honor Him by pursuing peace. And seek help as applicable. I've already mentioned godly counsel. So important. Your pastor, your, a biblical counselor, a mature Christian friend would absolutely be appropriate for counsel. And also, 
this help that you seek may be temporal assistance. The dynamics of conflict go in many different ways. It may be a uh, marriage relationship, it may be a custody relationship. You may need finan financial aid. You may need legal advice, medical care, child care. You may need justice from a um, police standpoint or a financial protection. So seek help as applicable. Also plan to minister to the offender in Christ. In Christ, make a practical and long term. So this is not a quick fix plan, but a practical and long term plan to reflect the teachings of Jesus. That is through love and mercy. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. And do not give up. The truth is, some of these unreconciled relationships may fade away with time. But we need to be faithful to God with every opportunity that we have. And always keep a God-centered perspective for your life. That is a biblical worldview. Rest in God. And do not let the offender's sin consume your life. It absolutely can. Do not let the offender's sin consume your life. Rest in God. We need to learn by faith how to face hard circumstances. Paul explained in Philippians 4, 11-13, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember, in Romans 8, 28-30, Paul writes, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined, to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. God will use your situations, that heat on your life, those situations, the behaviors of others, the struggles you have physically, mentally, and spiritually. He will use all of those things to make you like Jesus and is guaranteed to happen. God will bring His plan to completion, and one day we will be glorified without sin. Conflicts are opportunities to be like Jesus. Dr. Robert Jones states, Pursuing peace does not guarantee reconciliation. Remember that the perfect peacemaker was brutally murdered. Jesus, the perfect peacemaker, was not only rejected but brutally murdered. We should not expect that all relationships are going to be reconciled. For we are sinners living with sinners in a fallen world. And there will always be people to forgive that should be expected. Conflicts are inevitable and sin is always involved. When you face conflict, you need to pursue relational peace. Seek to please God. Repent of any heart sins, any sinful beliefs, sinful motives. Repent of any behavior sins, any sinful words, sinful actions. And when you are right with God, on that level one forgiveness that you have given that person to God, then you can go to the level two to reconcile that relationship when you approach that other individual and you love them. You love them. Love God and love people is the sum of the law. In Ephesians 4 and 32, it says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Jesus is the ultimate example of forgiveness. Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And as the elect of God, 
holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him.